reasons the councilman mentioned. So, you know, the minority in this country will be the majority in this century as we grapple with this issue. And African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans all disproportionately get this issue. They understand climate change. They go to the polls and, and in, in ways that recognize this as an issue and are prepared to invest in it, including their own um, resources. I mean, polls, national polls, local polls, all show that. The issue is there's this window of the time it takes for the minority to become the majority, climate change and its impacts are raging. So longer term, I think we're going to be a much more savvy and sophisticated country about this. But it's sort of what do we do in this sort of generation where all of these effects are being felt now, um, that's part of the challenge. But longer term, I think this is this is a huge part of this diversity of our country and what that will mean for how we how we uh, address the challenge. There are a number of questions. Uh, just a couple of quick points, um, and then if you could pass the mic back up, sort of just in this general direction. Um, the uh, I, I saw some numbers on Build It Back recently that something uh, less than two percent of the money has been spent 16 months later. Uh, there's like a one and a half percent. So there's a disconnect there. And also we, uh, I, I talked earlier about the um, investigation that uh, my project Adapt NY did with Falcon Gazette and found a real disconnect between City Hall and the Bloomberg administration and the community boards. That's sort of the most basic level of governance in the city. I mean, some would argue about their, their rel relative powerlessness, but they certainly have a, should have a voice. And it was really, a lot of this uh, content about the communication level. So there's a disconnect there, certainly. Um, there were a few questions here. So let's uh, let's get at them and use the, use the mic. And if you could, just just mention your name as well. I think here and then, and then there. Okay, so let's go in that direction. Yeah. And then one over there, too. I'm Karen Esther-Gaston. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Keep going. I'm Karen Workman, uh, and I work in the financial district, and that's where this question comes from. We saw a major impact in the financial district, and it's a unique area compared to others. What is, uh, what can be done? Well, uh, so, uh, I mean, the interesting thing about the financial dis district is who this, who's there, right? So you have a lot of corporations Field is a major property owner there. Uh, you, the, the way it's played out is that the answers for different types of tenants are very different, right? So Goldman Sachs can put in a microgrid and be fine, except that none of the people can actually get to work, right? <laughs> when your subway goes out. Um, what you're seeing is that um, companies can recover pretty quickly by investing huge sums of money in their own um, either hazard mitigation through elevation or removing uh, their data center to a top floor or by putting in a microgrid to, to island them from the rest of the electric grid or things like that. Um, but the challenge is really getting them to invest in the community that's there and um, you know it's a marathon not a sprint so um, you know recovery and long-term rebuilding are end up kind of blending together right so the question you know that we're trying to think about is how do you improve the adaptive capacity of uh, small and large businesses to think about uh, what's going to happen over the long term and how they should have why they should really have a stake in sort of their broader um, community in terms of rebuilding. So you know the solutions are going to have to be tailored to, to different people, but we would urge that you know uh, we can't just think you know that every building is an island because it doesn't work that way. Um, these we have about 15 minutes so let's we'll go through the questions and answers quickly and there are a couple things I particularly want to get to our media person there too because it's a big part of what we're doing. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Kristen Chu. I'm a freelance writer from Staten Island. Um, oh, I'm a freelance writer from Staten Island and it's become very clear to me that you can't address these issues without addressing poverty and lack of affordable housing. And yet I rarely hear this discussed. The people who live on Staten Island who were hit the hardest are in a neighborhood that on Staten Island we refer to as below the boulevard. 
who loves Highland Boulevard and um, small houses, a very stressed neighborhood in many respects, hit very hard by the recession, and uh, very dependent on community ties to get by. Now we're talking about either having them leave, and the, ge the governor's plan has so far been very generous, but it's been applied to very few people. And the rest of them are trying to figure out what to do next. They simply don't have the resources to just pick up and leave. So, so your question is, how do we address that? How do we address issue? poverty, and how do we integrate that into the plans? So that should be a short answer, addressing poverty. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very valid concern. Any quick now, thoughts? Uh, someone that I work with said, you know, you have your poverty and your crime and the problems that are your everyday vulnerabilities, and then you have the water issue. And if you don't fix the water issue, well, you fix your poverty issue in that location because nobody's going to want to be there anymore, right? Uh, and and if you fix the poverty issue and the crime and you know housing and all those everyday vulnerabilities, then you've also kind of fixed the flooding issue because everybody is more able to deal with you know stresses and shocks when they happen. So it's really it's really a challenge, um, and, and we understand that. Um, so I was at a community meeting the other night um, at, a, at a public housing um, a, a project, I guess, um, that's going to be flooded. It has been flooded. It's already, so many of the, the units have already been um, boarded up because of mold from Irene and then Sandy and then the blizzard. Right, and you know, people were saying, you know, the only way we, we survive this is because we actually pull together as neighbors. And you know, when we're talking them to imagine what could be there in the future, um, it's it's a challenge. You know, you know, we hear, I, I, we love our backyard. So can we can we have something that's uh, a raised duplex, but we still have a front and a back, so we can you know spend time with our neighbors in our yard and 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 having that community. And so when we're thinking about relocating people, it's a really serious challenge. You're right, your neighbors and your family and your community organizations, your houses of worship are what you need to get by. Um, and so I think it's critical that we address some of those ev everyday vulnerabilities because that's what's going to make you vulnerable when a disaster happens. Um, and, and just as, oh, did you want to ask? I was going to say, that's a great question for Mayor de Blasio. <laughs> and, and the reason is, these are the people he ran for were the disadvantaged and the vulnerable. And I think one of the things is, and again, I, you know, for you guys today, is the mayor, those are the people who he championed. Um, they are absolutely the most vulnerable people in this city in a climate changing world. And when it's cold, they're coldest. When it's hot, they're hottest. They're the slowest to evacuate. They're the slowest to rebuild. So how do you make smart investments today that address the challenges of the most vulnerable New Yorkers? And I think that's a really important question for, for this mayor. And it's something that, um, you know, Mayor Bloomberg didn't run on sustainability. He came to that later. My hope is that Mayor de Blasio will recognize the power of resiliency in meeting the needs of the chronically disadvantaged that he championed during the campaign. It's a, it's a central question. Uh, that really is the question. And uh, particularly in my district, I'm sure Staten Island and the Rockaways as well, and parts of Red Hook, similar issues have come up. Uh, and look at the evacuation plan, for example. And my committee will, at some point very soon, analyze the city's evacuation plan in light of the new FEMA flood maps, in light of the fact that whatever was zone B is now zone A now. And zone A is like zone AAA now. Uh, we'll see a lot more zone A. Uh, just to give you an example, the evacuation center for folks in Southwest Brooklyn is a school near Borough Park called FDR High School. First of all, if you just do the math, it cannot accommodate the thousands of families that would have to be forced to evacuate there. Uh, secondly, when uh, the, the previous mayor issued the mandatory evacuation, many folks did not evacuate due to many reasons. Uh, number one was financial hardships. Also, there's some language barriers as well. And the order was given way too late. And particularly in the public housing uh, buildings, many folks just did not leave, and they were trapped with no working elevators, no electricity, no heat. Uh, well, during that time, well, actually, no, it was already cold. And so many folks went through a couple of weeks, and so they had to go up the stairs to get them water and, and supplies. So we will be analyzing this evacuation plan because, to me, 
in light of the new data that we have, you know, I don't know who they relied on previously for their evacuation plan. I, I remember those packets, get ready or be ready New York and all that. Well, we were not ready, and we're still not ready right now. So we will be have to analyze all of these all of these factors. Right? But that your question cut to the heart of what we're talking about here today. So just before we get to the next question, I mean these are really some remarkably rich uh, points that are being made. As someone who covers this all the time, there's a lot of uh, depth here. And but one of the things I want to invite you to think about as you listen is if you're uh, if you had a particular constituency, whether as a journalist or your organization or whatever it might be, a reader, um, a, um, a voter, uh, how would you deal with these issues if you were focused on homeowners, if you were focused on the poor, if you were focused on ethnic communities, engineers, environmental activists, how, as you go out through the day, how would you share this information? And one thing I, I think is an overarching concern is can you divide by those kinds of definitions, those kind of constituencies, or, or are the solutions cross-cutting? And I think that's what you'll start to find is that you want to reach a particular constituency, think about that as you hear these responses, but how do you get broader than that as you find solutions? There's one question, and then I think we have time for short uh, two questions, and then I, I yeah, actually, I want to get a question after yours to uh, Kat, because I want to turn it to the media side of this. Is that okay? And then we'll end with your question. Sure. Okay. Okay. Please. Um, so my name is Corinne Rosen. Sorry. Hi. Um, I My question is, um, it sounds like that there's a lot of boilers that still need to be replaced now. And it seemed that Mayor Bloomberg, really part of his agenda was to switch all the boilers in New York City over to natural gas um, and to move forward doing that. Um, knowing that natural gas has a larger effect on climate change than oil, I want to know if there's a is if uh, the current mayor and council members included are considering relooking at that proposal and trying to switch those over to oil instead of natural gas. Well, I, I think you uh, already uh, exposed one of the questions that will be raised at the hearing, okay. uh, because one of the things we plan to, to raise at the hearing on the 27th is is the environmental impact. Of these boilers, and so uh, that's a great question, and hopefully I'll, I'll get you more information after the 27th. Um, also, just a slight yes. correction, actually. So Mayor Bloomberg did a good job of switching um, home heating fuels, which are typically sort of these heavy, kind of dirty heating fuels, to natural gas, which is actually cleaner than the oil. So well, it's a just slight. Yeah, but just to add to that, he could have switched to the other oil that's available. So there's a, there are two other oils that are available that burn just as clean, that burn clean, as clean as natural gas. And when you look at the full life cycle, they actually burn clean. So you guys have something to talk about at the yeah. coffee break. <laughs> 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 that's, that's a common misconception, yes. though. Is let that me, that let me, so. let me, uh, let me uh, turn to um, uh, Kat, uh, who has been sitting very patiently. Well, although she had a, a question, which I turned off because you're almost over earlier. <laughs> but I want to ask this. I mean, someone. Um, brought up, uh, I think it was you, Councilman, uh, New Orleans, the example of uh, Katrina. And one of the things I wanted to uh, point out is that a couple of years before Katrina, reporters at the New Orleans Times, Trick of Picayune, Times of Picayune, um, including one I know, an environmental reporter named Mark Schlipstein, wrote about the impending failure of the Levees and the risks. Uh, and what they wrote about is exactly what happened. Uh, unfortunately, it was not ignored and it was too late. Um, but the, the 